Why don't you turn in your Bibles to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 42 to 51. And this is where we continue this evening. Last week, we looked at the first section of this, and I titled this message, Expect the Unexpected, and we continue with Expecting the Unexpected this evening as well, from Matthew 24, verse 42 to 51. And God's word reads, Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. Who then is the faithful and prudent slave, whom his master put in charge of his household, to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes." Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that evil slave says in his heart, My master is not coming for a long time, and begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour which he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites, In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Just so far from God's word, let's go to him in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth that you have given us in your word. And we pray that you would help us this evening to be a people that will worship you and honor you. That you would guide us even as we seek to understand your word. And that you would do a work in the hearts of all that are here this evening. We know, Lord, that you know all things. You know our hearts, you know the purposes and the thoughts even within us, and I pray that you would do a mighty work, that you would work in each one of us, cause us to love you more, to expect your coming back at any moment, and to be a people that with anticipation look to you. And we pray, Lord, that you would guide us even this evening as a body of believers to be those that will worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to the cross Thank you, Father and Son, for sending your Holy Spirit. And we bless you this evening, triune God, for your goodness toward us, the children of men. We bless you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight we continue our message from this wonderful section under that same title, Expect the Unexpected, Part 2. And as we consider this, the unpredictable nature of the important guest's arrival, our Lord Jesus, he's coming soon, and we're to expect this unexpected reality. We are reminded to stay alert and to be prepared for our Lord's return. Jesus' teaching in this passage emphasizes the importance of living in a state of readiness, knowing that he will come at an unexpected time. Now, again, to remind you of some of the context, this is in Jesus' Olivet Discourse, where he is there teaching on the Mount of Olives, which is the place where he will return to. The Mount of Olives, the same place where he ascended on high. This is the area where he's busy teaching. I like to think at the same spot where his feet will descend on the Mount of Olives. But it could have been anywhere there on the Mount of Olives as he teaches his disciples. And Jesus speaks about the end times, the destruction of the temple and his second coming. And he stresses the need for vigilance and for spiritual alertness. And he uses the analogy of or to uses illustrations to for us to expect this unexpected nature of his return and the consequences of being either then a faithful or an unfaithful slave. And that's part of what we see in our passage. Last week, we looked at the first point, which was be ready um, under this main point of being ready is to stay awake, stay awake. And that's what we saw there in verse 42 to 44. And we also are reminded that this event, this thief in the night aspect doesn't actually take us by full surprise because we are children of the light. We are those that are removed from the destruction that is coming during that seven year tribulation. We are not destined for wrath. And so we expect the rapture to take place 
when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so we are not taken by surprise like the whole of the world is in this regard. But if we've been unfaithful, then indeed, yes, we will be taken by surprise. And the Lord will return and we will suddenly meet the Lord and go, oh, um, what has gone on? And we know that either we can expect to go and meet our Lord or we expect him to come to meet us. Those are the two options that we have. And if we look at the statistics of church history, then the most probable is that you'll go to meet him and you will give an account of what you have done in the flesh. You will stand before God, the maker of mankind. We will give an account before him. So we must live in a spiritual awakeness, which involves daily devotion to him, prayer, engagement with God's word. And it means eagerly awaiting Christ's return while faithfully serving him. We ought to be in such a spiritual unison with God that we are excited about the return of the Lord even. And we must examine our lives to ensure that we are not complacent, but actively pursuing holiness and godliness. I don't know about you, but there's been times in my life where I go, I hope the rapture doesn't happen right now. I hope that I first can get married. Or, hey, I hope that I first can have children. Maybe some of you are going, I hope I can first have grandchildren. But we should be actually saying, come, Lord Jesus, come. That should be the expectant hope of the believer. Come, Lord Jesus, come. So tonight we move on to our second point, and Lord willing, we'll even get to our third point. We'll see how the time goes. We'll explore how we can practically stay awake and to be ready for the Lord's return. So as I left you off last week, you might be asking the question based on the first one of staying awake. Well, how then do I stay awake? And I'm glad you asked that because that's what we're going into in the second one. Secondly, and this is how you stay awake, you keep doing what he told you to do. Being alert, staying awake actually means practically remaining faithful, putting one foot in front of the other, being obedient day by day, week by week, year by year, decade upon decade to what God has called you to by his word. It is obedience 101. And we see that there in verse 45 to 47. Because Jesus shifts in the parable about this, this faithful and wise slave. And we need to remember what we are before God. We are slaves before God. What have we that has not been received by him? Have we even our intellect that we could boast about? That we have gotten by ourselves? Have we gotten any of life by ourselves? Did we choose where we would be born or what parents we would have or what year we would like to be around in? There's so much of this reality of the fact that we are slaves to him. Now, there's some slaves that say he'll never return. There's other slaves that say he's coming soon. So we have the shift in Jesus' parable about the faithful and the wise slave who is put in charge of the master's household. In other words, he's a steward of God's household. He's a household manager, but he's a slave first before he's a steward. Because sometimes I think that we might get confused and think we're a, a steward first before we're a slave. No, we're a slave in his household and we've been given much that we will need to give an account for. The servant diligently carries out his duties, this faithful servant. He provides for the household at the proper time. You see that in verse 45. So he cares for others that are part of this household of his master. And when the master returns, he finds him so doing that which the master gave him to do. And he is rewarded and he is put in charge of all the master's possessions. So that just shows you that this household that he got possession over was simply the trial run, if you wish, for what was to come. That's the reality of this life, brethren. The reality of this life is that this is the trial run for what is to come. And based upon your faithfulness or your faithlessness is determining what the Lord will entrust to you or not entrust to you. You see how the master gives him charge over all his possessions. Verse 47. 
And this is very practical. It's stewardship 101. Being faithful to what God has called you to means that God will give you more to be faithful with. That's what it looks like to stay awake. Remain faithful. Remain obedient. Turn with me to a, pre- to a parallel passage, and it's sometimes helpful to look within the Gospels and say, where else does this, where, do, where else in the Gospels does, do we see this spoken about? And look with me at Luke chapter 12, verse 42 to 48. Because this is helpful and it proves the point even more for us. In Luke 12, verse 42 to 48. And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and prudent steward? This is the parallel passage. Faithful and prudent steward. Prudent means sensible or careful. Careful to do his his master's will. Faithful to keep doing his master's will and careful to make sure that he does his master's will in the way that the master has explained for him to do it. Yeah, you've given me my marching orders and I need to go according to the marching orders and I need to keep marching. And he's a steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants. Now there's this future tense element. To give them their rations at the proper time. I believe that this is speaking not just in the parable element. It's speaking about the prophetic element regarding the millennial reign of our Lord Jesus. We're going to be working. Did you know that? Work was never bad. Work existed before the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. Where they were called to be stewards of the garden that that the Lord had given them. We'll be working in the millennial kingdom. Now what will be given to our charge as those that are stewards at this moment? Stewards of our time and stewards of our efforts, stewards of our talents, stewards of this congregation at Benoni Bible Church. We might look at these things and think these are small things. Not so with our Lord. He looks and he sees how do we manage the small things that he gives us to manage. Verse 43 of Luke 12 says this, Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. We're told, brothers and sisters, in the New Testament, that we who are faithful and endure to the end will reign with Christ. We are co-laborers at this moment with Christ regarding this marvelous gospel that we have been entrusted with. But how you and I live with what has been entrusted to us here now determines what we'll be entrusted with then. Blessed is the slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. But then there's this warning in verse 45 of Luke 12. And this is the similar, again, this is the parallel passage to ours in Matthew. But if that slave says in his heart, where does unfaithfulness begin according to God's word? Saying something in your heart. It's when you're listening to yourself, not speaking to yourself. The truth of what God's word says. He says in his heart, and what does he say that causes him to be an unfaithful servant? My master will be a long time in coming. Remember the title of our sermon tonight and last week? Expect the unexpected. You see, because that's how important this is. This unfaithful slave says, Jesus isn't coming soon. He's been gone so long. Surely he's going to be gone longer. And he begins to beat the male and female servants. And to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect. And at an hour that he does not know. And will cut him in pieces. And assign him a place with the unbelievers. 
This even indicates to us that this person actually thinks that they saved. They might even be part of the household of God. But how are they living? They are living for me, myself, and I. And I must get what I want as I'm part of this household and Jesus isn't coming anytime soon. So it's a party for me. I'm going to get my own. I'm going to have what I want and I'm going to eat my own cake. And he forgets who the master is. But then we also see in Luke, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to give you this cross-reference and this parallel passage, because we actually see the mercy of God that comes out. Because the master of that slave will come on a day and he assigns him a place with the unbelievers, this individual that is beating up his fellow servants. But then we get an indication of two other slaves as well. In verse 47 he says, And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many beatings. So there's an there's the mercy, isn't there? Because there's the one that gets cut up in pieces and is thrown out and is assigned a place with the unbelievers. I would say that that's an individual that is a false convert. Somebody that is an apostate. Somebody that actually was not a part of his household in the first place. But then you have this other individual, which it's possible, dear Christian, that you might be that type of an individual. Where you actually do know the will of the Lord. It's been revealed to you, but you're not getting ready. It's just, you know, yeah, I know Jesus is coming back, but I'm just going to live my own way just a little longer. And I've heard this from some professing Christians as well. Well, maybe when I'm old one day, then I'll start serving the Lord a little bit better. You know, then I would have gained some wisdom. No, you're not gaining any wisdom with that attitude. All you are gaining is folly with that. You don't own tomorrow. Don't be a fool that says, well, soul, just be happy, eat, drink, be merry. You know, could be that your life is required of you. And you go and meet the Lord and you go to him before he comes to you. (laughs) So this individual receives many beatings, not cut up in pieces, but many beatings. And then there's another one. But the one who did not know it. In other words, there's an ignorance about the will of the Lord and committed deeds worthy of a beating will receive but a few. Do you see the mercy of the Lord, even in regard to those that actually might not know? And if you studied any of church history, you'd realize just how how blessed we are in our day that many of us have multiple copies of God's word. Do you know that most Christians since Acts 2 didn't even own their own Bible? There's many that were ignorant about some of the things that we are not ignorant about. You and I are even more culpable before God for the truth that we receive. You know, and, and I get frustrated sometimes when I see some of our members don't come to church services, but maybe it's a good thing for them. You know, because the more you come, the more you hear, the more that you're culpable before God. Because he says here, the one who did not know it and commits deeds worthy of a beating will receive but a few. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much of him, they will ask all the more. Do you see this principle of stewardship once more? Being faithful with a little, and he gives more to be faithful with and more to be faithful with. So how are you walking before him? We are to live out our lives as Christians, as saved individuals, for the benefit of the rest of the household of God. That's how we ought to live. That's in line with all of the New Testament. If you go and just underline all of the one another passages in the New Testament, and you go and look at the great commandment of the Lord regarding loving the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and then loving your neighbor as you love yourself, and you recognize that even with the gifts that we've received, we are to be living in such a way that the church is edified. That is built up. We are built up in Christ and we are to build up in Christ. This is the project that we are called towards. We are to be those that live in such a way that we live for the benefit of the rest of the household of God. We are to have an attitude that we are the slaves of Jesus. 
And therefore, we are the servants of all the other slaves of Jesus. That's the right kind of an attitude. That's the attitude of a faithful servant, a faithful steward, a faithful slave. We have a responsibility to do that which the master has left in our charge. And we're going to answer for it. And we must remember that we are accountable for this. Listen to 1 Peter 4, verse 7 to 11. I'm saddened to think that in our day, many a times, we have a wrong view of the sovereignty of God that lets people feel like they're off the hook regarding their responsibility. And I would say that that's not then a biblical view of the sovereignty of God at all. When you rightly understand the sovereignty of God, oh boy, that gives you strength in your step and your stride. And it fills you with a vigor to do that which he has called you towards, knowing that he even blesses your stumbling efforts. Listen to 1 Peter 4, verse 7 to 11. The end of all things is at hand. What's Peter talking about? He's talking about the same thing that we're reading about in Matthew and what we're reading about in Luke. The end of all things is at hand. There's this imminent element of this. There's this expect the unexpected. Therefore, be of sound thinking and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. And by the way, Peter knew exactly what this was about. Remember how he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he did not stay awake? How he fell asleep. You see how that physical illustration of what happened with Peter in the garden actually has deeper spiritual realities. You need to be those that are of sound thinking and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Peter knew I was not sound in my thinking and sober in my spirit and I fell asleep when my Lord asked me to pray. And now we are called because the end is at hand. We are called to be those that are awake. We are called to be those that keep doing what he's called us to do. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. So the temptation is for us to grow cold in our love for one another because he tells us keep fervent in this. Ferventness is keeping the coals hot. Keep fervent in your love for one another. Oh, well, I love the brethren. Right? You might say. But are you fervent in your love for the brethren? Is there an urgency in your love for the brethren? Because that urgency is driven by the reality that Jesus is coming soon. I want to be found in his household treating his servants well. Because what happens to the one that's beating up his fellow servants? There's a consequence. Because love covers a multitude of sins. What are you talking about here, Peter? You mean that inside of the church we're going to sin against one another? And you mean that the sinning against one another because of the differences that we have and because of the personalities that we have and because of the ways that we are, you mean that that's going to affect my ferventness in my love? Yes, that's what Peter means. Love covers a multitude of sins. How much have we been forgiven our debts by our gracious Lord? And how dare we grab onto one another by the scuff and shake until we get what is ours? Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Isn't that quite something? You know that hospitableness, actually that word comes from the love of strangers. That's the actual meaning of hospitable towards one another within the household of God. And then he says, without grumbling. I I know that like, I know a lot of Christians that are really hospitable. But it's sad to find that there's few that are hospitable without grumbling. Oh, they better, they better see the effort I put in with this. Oh, I have to clean my house. (laughs) What, you you mean you don't want to clean your house when others don't come and visit? Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received the gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. You see the picture that he gives to us? You've been given some gifts and you're meant to take those gifts and you're meant to say, hey, I'm so glad you were looking for work, gift. Well, you can work in me and with me to honor God's people. And so you're employed. Gift, you didn't belong to me. 
You were given to me and you're going to be used by me for his glory and the edification of his body, employing it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. What does it look like being a good steward? It looks like you taking responsibility with what God has gifted you with for the edification of his body. And then he gives us an indication of the fact that he's talking about different kinds of gifts because each one of us is gifted differently. He says, whoever speaks as one speaking the oracles of God. That's what's meant to happen from this pulpit. It's meant to be, thus says the Lord. It's the oracles of God. Are you hearing, church, the voice of Jesus? It's the oracles of God. Whoever serves as one serving by the strength which God supplies. That's whether you're leading the songs, whether you're playing the piano, whether you're serving some tea or coffee, or whether, like this morning, we didn't have enough pressure from the pressure pump to run the dishwasher, and so the dishes got washed by hand. Guess what happens there? Wonderful opportunity. God, you've given me the strength to do this task. And I do this in my service of one another as a good steward. I serve as one that serves by the strength which God supplies. I mean, you know, you you sometimes get some comments. I'll just let you in on some of those comments. You know, you stand at the door and somebody says, well done, as they walk out. And you go, what do you mean well done? Or somebody says, congratulations. What are you congratulating me for? I understand we want to be polite. Somebody doesn't know what to say sometimes. But the reality is, what have we that has not been given to us? You know, praise God if we're able to use what God has given to us for the benefit of his people. What an absolute privilege. Yes, it is a responsibility. And you'll be held accountable whether you use what God has given or whether you don't use what God has given. But what an absolute privilege. Because God can do what God wants to do with or without you and me. So the fact that he would use you and me, that's a marvel of marvels. Because if, I don't know when last you looked at yourself. And started to go, well, you know what? It's easy for us to criticize one another and to look at one another and find the faults in one another. But when last did you see all the faults in you? And yet God in his mercy will use you. If only you will say, Lord, here I am. I lay my life down. Part of the problem with many a Christian is that they take their life up. They think that's what happens when they come to Christ. No, you don't take your life up. You lay it down and you keep laying it down. And you say, I'm yours, Jesus, to use as you wish, Jesus. You lay down your life for me. You paid that price at Calvary and I'm yours. I'm not my own. I'm his who bought me with the price of his blood. And he has given to each one of us the gifts that he desires that we would use them for the edification of the body. Isn't this marvelous? So employ these gifts, use them. And then he says there, uh, so that, because when he talks about in verse 11, whoever speaks, speaking the oracles of God, whoever serves as one serving by the strength which God supplies, he says, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. What is happening when we live like this? We are living in Christ. And Jesus Christ gets the glory. God actually gets all the glory through Jesus Christ. Because we find our life in him and we live in him and he lives in us. So what is the picture? What is the purpose? This this is us abiding in the vine and the vine then has the life which is in us, which then bears the fruit. And the vine dresser gets all of the glory. He gets to come through and enjoy the fruit which his son has brought about in us. You see, it's our Lord Jesus who did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I've told you before that I think that's probably the key verse for deaconing in all of the New Testament, because Jesus uses the word deacon twice there. Jesus, he says, I I didn't come to be deaconed, but to deacon and give my life as a ransom for many.
that word deacon is also the word for minister and for service. Jesus did that. That's what we're called towards. He said, I, your master, have done this. Remember what he did in John 13 as he washes his disciples' feet? And he says, I've done this for you. I've humbled myself like this. I have taken your dirty, muddy, ugly feet in my hands. I mean, some of you with six toes and all this. I've done that. And I've loved you like this. And I've humbled myself like this. And I've served you. And if I, your master, have done this, if I, your Lord, have done this, should you not do likewise? And remember what was happening with them still at that point? And this is sadly the reality sometimes with us too, is they were busy arguing with one another about who's the greatest. It's like they missed what he was talking about. Jesus, who was and is the greatest, served like that. That's what we're called towards. That's this being ready. So how do we apply then this? Well, faithfulness in our duties as Christians involves this ongoing, diligent obedience to Christ's commands. And it involves wise stewardship of the responsibilities that he has entrusted to us. We we can't be responsible for everybody else's responsibilities. We are responsible for the responsibility that he has individually given each one of us. In the spheres that he's given us. You do what God has called you to do. And you don't worry too much about God's other slaves. You focus on what God has given you to do. And you do that to the best of your ability. You see what happens sadly. Amongst many a Christian. Is that they start looking at how others are not doing what they should have been doing. Or what they think they should be doing. Which they're not doing. And then they think it's okay for me to take my foot off the pedal. And to stop serving the Lord as faithfully as I was serving him. Because have you seen how unfaithful these other guys are? (laughs) But you know what happens when we have eyes for the Savior alone and when we lay down our lives day by day and we serve him like that? It's contagious. And a local church begins to do that. And more and more, the individuals in a local church begin to do that because we're running hard after our Savior. And we have eyes for him alone. And we're laying our lives down. And we're not worrying so much about everybody else. We're not worrying about the pats on the back. We're not worrying about the shout from the crowd that says, crucify him too. We're not worried about all of that stuff because we got eyes for Jesus. And we serve Jesus. And in our service of Jesus, we can't help but let that service of Jesus overflow to one another. Because that's the practical way in which we truly serve Jesus. Even a glass of water in his name. Worthy service. So faithful in our duties as Christians with this diligent obedience to Jesus' commands and wise stewardship. This includes, as we looked at this morning in our meeting, the Great Commission. That's his commands towards us. He's told us, this in Matthew twenty eight eighteen to 20, where he says to them, all authority has been given me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to keep all that I command you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And how do we do that? Well, we live out the great commandment, Matthew 22, verse 37 to 39. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. What are we teaching one another? The commandments of Jesus. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang the whole law and the prophets. It's pretty simple, actually. How would you like to be treated and served Do that for each other. And when you're focused on doing that for each other, guess what starts to happen? Usually you're getting served by one another too. It's a wonderful thing in God's house. Be steadfast in your service. Use your borrowed time. Do you know that each one of you is living on borrowed time? Today's borrowed time. We don't deserve today. We don't deserve tomorrow. He has been merciful to us. He has been gracious to us. It's borrowed time. Use the talents which are also borrowed to you. He can take away the talents that he's given you. What talents has God given you? You know that very easily he can take those talents away. 
Maybe you use your voice for him. He could take your voice away. Maybe you use your hands for him. He could take your hands away. It's all borrowed to you and to me. What about the resources that God has given to you? Use them for the glory and for the glory of God and the benefit of one another. What have we that we have not received from above? Is there anything? And what have we that we will not need to give an account for before the Lord? We'll give an account for every good gift that he's given us. You remember that... um, I don't really like cartoons and things like that, but I can't help but think about that program some years ago called Finding Nemo. And there was this little fish that had a bad memory, Dory. And she just said, well, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. And that's how I think the Christian life ought to be. You just keep serving. You just keep serving. And you just keep serving. And you ought to have that kind of a memory of a Dory where you're not so worried about what happened yesterday and you just keep serving today. And it's one more day that's closer to me either going to be with my Lord or it's one day closer to my Lord coming to me. That's this kind of a mentality. Keep doing what you were saved to be doing. Not saved by good works, but saved for the good works that were prepared beforehand that you would walk in them. And then just keep on doing that. I see that I'm already at almost 40 minutes. So I'm going to close. And then next week we'll look at the last sermon on this in the evening service. And we'll look at verse 48 to 51. But I think I've given you enough to chew on for one night. And then you can just keep swimming. (laughs) Keep on serving the Lord Jesus Christ with all that is in you to serve him with. And you know what's marvelous? is even in those moments when you might despair and when you might feel overwhelmed or when you might feel weak, he gives the strength. That's what's wonderful about our Lord, because we can cry out to him as weaklings as we are, and we can say, Lord, I'm weak. Please help me, because you're strong. Lord, I'm not wise, but you're all wise. I need your wisdom. Lord, help. I think that's just a simple prayer that every Christian should learn to have in every and all situations. Lord, help. Help. I need your help because I can't do this apart from you doing it with me. And guess what it is? What's so beautiful about true stewardship before the Lord Jesus is that his burden is not burdensome. That's wonderful. See, when you're able to bear what he gives you to bear with joy because it's Christ in you that bears that burden with you. That's That's where you've actually unlocked the key to what great godliness looks like because it's with contentment and you bear the burden that the Lord has given you to bear and you lay your life down. That's discipleship. Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow him. And then, guess what? Do it again tomorrow. But expect the unexpected. Before you know it, you'll be with him. Before you know it, Before you can really say it, next thing you see him face to face. We tend to think that our life is long. Our life's not long. What is your life? What is your life? It is but a vapor. Here today, gone tomorrow. You'll be with the Lord soon. You'll meet him. And this is the reality of expecting the unexpected. Let's go to him in prayer.